other end of the hierarchy was uh, bounded depth Frege or AC0 Frege. So our next speaker, Kilian Risse, will tell us about the latest news in some uh, lower bounds for uh, bounded depth Frege proofs. So Kilian, please take it away. Yeah, so, uh, yeah. thanks for inviting me. Uh, this will be a bit more technical than the previous talks. I'm sorry about this. Uh, then it's trying to work with uh, Johan Hostad, uh, one of my, I don't know, is he my ex advisor or school advisor? <laughs> I don't know, but he was my advisor until like last fall. So, yeah. Okay. So, just to give you a picture again of where we are. So, so right, we have resolution here, and then we have this like hierarchy of logic uh, proof systems. So, we have RESK, and then we have ResLog N, then we have bounded depth Frege. Frege and extended Frege. Uh, then we have like one semi algebraic proof system, say cutting planes. Uh, and here we have like the algebraic proof systems, in which turns out some polynomial calculus. And if we go really crazy, we can consider a proof system such as the ideal proof system, uh, which are very strong. But you really just know like lower bounds for, for CNF formulas for, for these somewhat weak proof systems. Though, though I, I was very happy that uh, Robert referred to bounded depth frege as a strong proof system. So I, I'm <laughs> going to show you how to prove uh, lower bounds for this strong proof proof system bounded depth frege. Okay. Yeah. So yeah, I'll, I'll first introduce like frege, uh, state our results, and then try to give you some idea of how, how to prove such a result. Okay. So how, how should we think of the frege proof system? So it's just a sequence of, of uh, Boolean formulas over some basis. Uh, we'll use or and not, but because I don't want to torture you, I'll use this shorthand called and uh, for, for not or not. And then we can like write out like a Boolean formula here. So, so it's tree-like if we ignore the leaves where the variables live. And yeah, you can assume that it's or not, uh, or and, and so on, alternating. Uh, and this circuit happens to compute XOR, okay? Or no formula. So, yeah. And then each line we have to derive it, right? So, or it's a clause. So either we take a clause from our original CNF, or we derive an, a new Boolean formula from two or a constant number of previous Boolean formulas. And for this, we have to do use these derivation rules. Uh, it's not so important what they are precisely, like somehow as long as Every derivation rule depends only on a constant number of assumptions, like all these systems polynomials simulate each other. Uh, but this is one proof system that we may consider. It's like somehow the first four rules are kind of boring. They just manipulate somehow the structure of your formula. And really the interesting rule is this last one, which is a generalization of uh, the resolution rule. So, so what does it say? Well, if you have a formula of the form Q or P, where Q and P are formulas themselves, and you also have the formula not P or R, then you can actually like resolve over P and not P, and then you can derive Q or R. So you should really think of this as like a generalized version <coughs> of uh, resolution where we now can branch over more complicated objects. And because we want the, we want the refutation that the CNF has a satisfying assignment, we want that the final line is Con, uh, constant false, so, so that there are no satisfying signs. Some standard size measures or measures that we consider. So we have the length of a proof, which is the number of formulas occurring in your proof. We have the line size, which is the maximum size of any formula in your proof. Then we have the size, which is just the sum of the sizes of all formulas occurring, and the depth, which is the maximum logical depth of any formula occurring. Then, like, I mean, uh, one of the long standing open problems is to actually prove like super polynomial length floor bounds for Frege refutations. Unfortunately, we really don't know what to do about this or how to prove such a, such a lower bound. And, and what we do is we somehow restrict all our proofs. Namely, we restrict our proofs to use like only, say, constant depth formulas. And that like to, to demonstrate that this is a real restriction, like if you take this circuit and you request or require that it's more shallow, well, then the size explodes, right? So, so, so like restricting the, the size of uh, the depth of each formula may, may blow up the proof uh, considerably. Okay. When you calculate depth, you're allowed to use this band. Yeah, like I'm, I'm assuming I have unbounded because otherwise it's like in constant depth, I can only talk about. 
happens to the many variables in that set. Uh, yeah, it's really it's really the logic that that number of or not of alternations. Any other questions? So yeah, so I also want to prove the load on for particular uh, formula, and we will consider the Thetian formula. So, so what is the Thetian formula? The Thetian formula is defined over a graph, connect the graph. Uh, we have Boolean variables for every edge, and every vertex is associated with an axiom, claiming that an odd number of edges incident to each vertex is set to one. Okay, so in particular, this is a satisfying assignment, while this one is not because it like violates the vertex axioms at these two points as there are an even number of edges set to one next one. It's not so hard to show that the Zetian formula is satisfiable even only if the number of vertices is even. Uh, and so from now on, we'll just assume that our graphs always have an odd number of vertices. And in fact, I will fix the graph that we'll consider. We'll consider the two-dimensional n by n torus. What do I mean by this? Well, it's this n, like this, this mesh defined over over a two-dimensional donut, say. Uh, I'll not draw this picture from now on, but I'll like put it into the plane. And actually, I'll drop like the, the edges wrapping around because it's impossible to draw. So, so if I draw a grid, it's understood from now on that I actually talked about the torus. Okay. And real quickly, let me just tell you what the pigeonhole principle is. Well, it claims that n plus one pigeons fit into n holes so that every pigeon has its own hole. Uh, formalize this by introducing Boolean variables. For each pigeon hole pair with the intended meaning that if it's set to true, then pigeon P goes to hole H. Uh, every pigeon claims to fly at least to one hole, and every hole is occupied by at most one pigeon. So just really quick, I suppose everyone knows this. Okay, so some history. So, so what is the game in proving down the depth regular bounds? So, so we want to prove super polynomial refutation size lower bounds for as deep a proof system as possible. Okay. So the first lower bound was by Aitai, who showed that for any constant depth Frege proof system, these refutations need to be of super polynomial size. And then this D was not explicit, and follow up work then made it explicit to, to log SAR of N. Uh, still not very strong, but then these works by Krajcek, Putlak, Woods, and Pitassi, Beeman, and Baliazzo actually managed to extend this up to dot depth log log N. And we were really stuck at this step for a long, long time. And like, I'm going to ignore for now the developments on the second side. And now, like, really, since the last few months, like, yeah, Hostad managed to actually push this low round up to that log n over log. Like, on the Zetian side, if you look at the Zetian formula, like, there was Benson and Urquhart in the late 90s who considered the Zetian formula, and they showed it up to that log log n. This was after these papers. And this was then by a really nice work was extended to like depth log n. And this was the first one to get this depth. So, so I, yeah, it's really this work that got the first time like this kind of log n depth. Uh, and then Hostad actually also closed this line of work off <laughs> by his log n over log log n depth. Uh, and these are essentially all the lower bounds we have for, for bounded depth free game. If we restrict ourselves to CDNFs. And they're proof by the same technique. Like we have one technique to prove it and nothing else. So please develop new techniques. <laughs> it's unbearable. <laughs> so, yeah, but okay. So, so let, let me uh, go like tell you what, what uh, Hossad actually proved. So, he showed that the, any Frege refutation of the Zetian principle defined over this two dimensional n by n torus, uh, if, if these refutations are Restricted to depth d, then these require a size exponential n to the one over fifty eight d. And you cannot hope for a significant improvement on the dependence on d in the second exponent. If you would do this, we would get regular bounds. Okay. So at least in my mind, this was all done. Like, like I don't see any way how to improve this interest in like an interesting manner. And then. Pitassi, Ramakrishnan, and Tan came along and asked this beautiful question of, well, we can restrict the depth of each line, but we could also restrict the size of each line, right? So what happens then? Can we then prove actually stronger low bounds? And they actually managed to do this. I think this is really cool. I, I was surprised that you can do this. 
So, so if you restrict the, the, the lines, not just to depth D, but also to line size N, then you get this exponential in N divided by some factors. Just to illustrate the, the, the parameters, like if you restrict the line size to be polynomial in N, then this lower bound is like almost fully exponential in N, up to depth like square root log N, whereas the previous lower bound that I showed you, as soon as D is a growing function in N, then the lower bound is of the form exponential N to the little of one. So these lower bounds are much, much, much stronger. Okay. And they conjecture that this is actually not the end of the story, and, and one should be able to, to improve this lower bounds to be exponential in n over log n to the d. Okay. So yeah, our result, our main result is, is basically resolving this uh, conjecture. And we show that indeed, like, like such reputations require this length. And just to give you again a feeling for parameters, so now we can go in quasi polynomial line size as well as up to depth log n over log log n, and we still get this almost fully exponential uh, lower bounds on the length of repetitions. Yes? Why do you want to look at this slide? Because circuits computing XOR of. Oh, sorry, yes, thank you. So the question is, why do we have a d minus one here in the exponent? Uh, because uh, the, the yeah. lower bound. This is kind of the tight upper bound. Yes, but, and we, we don't have a, a real syntactic proof, but we have a if you consider somewhat the sem semantic proof system, then then you can actually prove that this should be. And it, it comes really from from bounded depth x or lower bound, say, where you also have an exponential in n to the one over d minus one. Yeah, I I believe we get d minus one here if I write the polylog n here. Okay, and along the way we actually improve this uh, size lower bound of Hostad uh, to be exponential in n to the one over d minus one, which previously was n to the one over fifty eighty. <laughs> it's a big improvement, but this should be now tight. Uh, I don't have proof that this is tight. It should be tight because this is the size that you need in depth D to represent an XOR over N variance. And I'm suppressing polylog factors in it. Question? Matching upper bound for the line size? And no, we, we don't have any matching. I mean, we have a construction of a semantic proof which achieves this, but. Uh, oh, but it's not, semantic. I yeah, not okay. the proper proof. Johan pushed me to try to do it, but it's too big. <laughs> so all the lines here are really formulas, right? Yes. Like, yeah. So you're not like allowing like you could imagine like bounded depth applications of the extension rule, and that could shrink it even more, right? Yeah. No. 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 But our lower bound also applies for for circuits. Oh. It's oh. Okay. Okay. Problems to actually distinguish okay. these, but I mean, cool. because we 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 have a polylog here. And here I'm also having some polylogs, but like we cannot see this difference yet. But like it would be nice to actually get like expansion D and Z to one over D. But yeah, exactly. Yeah, I, I don't know how to combine Grossman's like notion of this time. I have no idea. Okay. Anything else? Okay. Some ideas how to prove size or rods. So I'll um, yeah, so, so yeah, we talked already about the bounded depth circuits. So it shouldn't be so surprising that we actually use machinery <coughs> developed to prove uh, bounded depth circuit lower bounds. So let me like really, really like give a really rough outline of, of how this argument goes. So what do we do? Well, suppose you're given a small circuit of depth D that computes parity on n bits. Then we want to hit the circuit C with the restriction rho that keeps each variable alive with probability p, meaning it does not assign it, and with probability 1 minus p, each variable independently sets it to 0 or 1 uniform address. Okay. And then you want to argue that, oh, under this restriction, my, my circuit actually shrinks in depth by 1. And then I repeat this d times, and I'm left with a constant, that circuit computing constant, but hopefully my, my function is, is still non-constant. And the main technical step in, in actually we're like completing this proof is to prove the switching up. 
So let me tell you what the switching lemma does. So, so what, what the statement of the switching lemma somehow guarantees you is that if you take a DNF with bottom fanning bounded by T and you hit it with a restriction row, then you can write this, rewrite this formula as a CNF with bottom fanning at most S. Okay. So F under row can be represented as a CNF with low bottom fanning. And then there is some failure probability, like over the randomness of your choice row, that this uh, actually does not happen. And by a classic result of host that you can like, actually bound this by, by, by something that is independent of n. I, I still think this is a bit surprising. But yeah. And yeah, then just how, how do you apply this? Well, you look at the bottom two layers, you switch them, applying this switching lemma, and then you can collapse the, those layers and you're left with that d minus one and you continue. So we want to apply this machinery to Frege proofs. Okay. So how do we do this? Uh, this is actually not how the proof goes, but, but let's pretend we can do this. So we hit the Frege refutation uh, with a restriction row. So the, the depth of every line shrinks by one. But this is not all. What I also have to guarantee is that I don't suddenly introduce contradiction in my initial formula. Right? Like if I hit my formula by this restriction, I don't want to have Contradiction already in my formula becomes then it becomes very easy to repeat this one. So I additionally need to guarantee that I, I can like maintain the, the structure of, of my original form. And this is somehow where all the complications arise. You really want to go from a large state instance to a small one. And yeah, again, you prove the switching lemma. Uh, I bury all the details, but the original proof of Hosta somehow managed to get this failure probability with this. S to the 27. Uh, it turns out that you need to do union bound over all subformulas occurring in your proof. So you need this to be less than one over the inverse of the size of your proof. Uh, and this S to the 27 really like cost this only second exponent, like exponentially n to the one to 50 AT. And our new proof now manages to replace this by a log n instead of S. And then, yes, again, skipping a few steps, we get this exponential n to the one to 50 Yes. Uh, is it true that uh, what you've just said that if you uh, uh, introduce contradictions, it becomes easy because you can have hard contradictions? No, no, no. I mean, like you violate the axiom of the thing. Like, like you, asked, you said, an even number of variables to zero next to one vertex. So it's not the, 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 the contradiction, it's the fact that it's an easy contradiction. Yes. Gross. Yes, I have to like maintain the hardness or supposed hardness of this form. Like, yeah. Okay. So yeah. So so this was for the size of our bound, and then I also should maybe tell you something about our main result, how one proves this. So, so uh, here we we really follow uh, Pilasi, Ramakrishna, and Tan. They show that you can use multi-switching, another notion from switching terminology, to prove these frigate trade-offs, which is really surprising because multi-switching was devised to, to actually get these correlation upper bounds for circuits, like compare it with the circuit. And you, but it turns out that this is also a useful tool to prove these frigate trade-offs, like line size versus length uh, results. So we have to prove multi-switching. So I'll try to explain to you again what, what the main what the statement is, but I will not do it. So, so first, the switching lemma guarantees you actually something better. It does not just tell you you can go from DNF to CNF, but it tells you that you can go from a DNF into a bounded depth decision tree. So, so what is a decision tree? You query a variable x, and depending on its value, you go either left or right. And now, if you remember from the proof outline, we had to do this union bound over all subformulas occurring in your proof. And we want to not to do that. We want to do something smart. So what is a reasonable thing to do? Well, you could consider many DNFs together at once, right? And then analyze somehow then having some object and then say something weird. And then what a multi-switching lemma does is it tells you that if you consider many DNFs, then you can, under this restriction row, represent them as the following. You represent them as a partial common decision tree of bounded depth. And then each DNF that you consider has like these small decision trees hanging off this partial decision tree, so that the combination of this large tree and these small trees 
actually decide your DNF under this restriction rule. Okay, so, so for different uh, DNFs, you have these small decision trees like dangling off your, your large partial form decision. And then now again, you can like analyze the failure probability of what's happening. And it turns out that you can bound it by this expression, which is essentially the same failure probability as you have for multi switching lemma, except this factor, which is due to the construction. So we kind of get the same thing. So. Okay. So I'm, how much time do I have? Let's say four, five minutes. Four, five minutes. Okay. So, yeah, but like all the fun in these proofs happens in how you design this restriction row. But like this restriction row, how you choose this is like really important. So, so I at least want to tell you what, what this restriction is and what it does and give you an idea of how it's used. So we use the same restriction or essentially the same restriction to this hostile and this PRT paper. And yeah, just to remind you, what you want is to start with a safety instance over a large grid and you want to end up with a safety instance over a smaller grid. And what we do is we hit the proof with a F fine restriction, meaning that we every original X variable we either set to one zero or a new variable or a negation of the So how, how do we come up with such a restriction? So, so first we hit the entire proof with a restriction setting every edge one or zero so that the vertices that should survive have an even number of ones next to them and all others have an odd number of ones next to them. So, so and then we, we like want to really represent this as a variable y for pi for each path. And what we do is we replace like negative things by the negation of the corresponding variable and positive things with positive things along this path. And we do this, we get this restriction, and this is the restriction that we use. And it has this nice property that any vertex on the path, you can verify that under any assignment to the y variables, you actually have an odd number of ones next to it. And these vertex axioms have still the same form of an axiom. So, so you're really left with, with this uh, smaller instance over the Sorry, what is the fine restriction? And this seems like just a restriction. With not some substitution. Yeah, yeah, it's the restriction with substitution. So why is it fine? Well, I mean, it has to respect negations. Or I, I don't know, it's a name that people have chosen and I'm just reusing this name. I, I do not fully agree with me. I agree. But uh, it's professional. So. Okay, so this was the restriction. Now I have to tell you how to actually choose such restriction. Okay. So we start with this large grid and we want to end up with a smaller grid. And you could just like pick any uh, like subgrid and, and choose this as a restriction, but the issue is that you get a lot of dependence between nodes, like which one you choose and so on. And you want to prevent this. So, so what you do is first you like cut your, your whole grid into smaller pieces and you guarantee that you pick one vertex from each such subgrid. So, so then you get independence in a sense, which is important. And then again, as before, we, we, we pick a solution to the formula where the blue nodes now have an even constraint. So this is now a satisfying instance. And then we connect them by some paths in a very careful manner. Uh, it's not important what this precisely is. And, and then we connect them and we, we end up with this like smaller torus. Okay. And actually, in, in the, the main issue with this is that if you look at this restriction, it's very easy to find these nodes because these are just the nodes that have an even constraint. All others satisfy the odd constraint at a vertex or at a node. Okay. So we want to obfuscate this, and therefore we need an intermediate restriction to hide where, where these blue nodes are. What you do is like you pick two vertices in adjacent subsquares. And you connect them by a path, you flip the value along this path so that these also have an even constraint. And then we do this a bunch of times. We then somehow left with this restriction, or at least pretend to have this restriction. And the main property that we have is now that it's difficult to tell whether the blue node is this one, this one, this one, or this one. Okay. So somehow we use this in the restriction. And yeah, the key difference, like for anyone who has ever read these proofs, uh, the key difference is that. Previous restrictions had roughly as many uh, such vertices in each subsquare, and we now have lower. One limitation of this technique, very annoying, is that we need to assign a huge number 
of, of, of variables for, for one step. And so, so this means that we can only apply this technique to these formulas that are almost satisfying or like minimally unsatisfying. <coughs> and we cannot apply them to like formulas that are only locally satisfying, like say random CNFs or something. So yeah, that's it for me. So just to reiterate what we proved. So, so if you have line size n and depth t, we get this exponential in n over log n to d. And if you only restrict to depth d, then we get this exponential n to the one over d. Some open problems. I think I listed them like from easy to hard. Let's see. So the first one is that our lower bound is somehow exponentially the square root of the number of variables because this formula has n squared many variables. Can we actually get a lower bound that is exponential in n to the one over d with n variables? So is like improving like a square root. And like an obvious candidate to try is at least to, to try this for taking over its other. I think this might get broken. The next question, which is due to you by film, was actually, and it's a question that you asked before, is like our lower bounds uh, cannot distinguish whether you have formulas or circuits of low depth on, on each line. And can you actually make this like distinction uh, in a sense, like, yeah, prove this exponentially d times n to the one or d lower bound? And then, yeah, like really nice problems, but I have no idea what to do. Uh, proof about that regular bounds for like supposedly hard formulas, such as like the truth table pathology, uh, clique, or random scene. I just don't know what to do. Yeah. Is there really a way to uh, actually prove these uh, constant depth spread the lower bounds without uh, the proof field? So you just to have the specific properties of the switching lemma and the topology you need without discussing the, the proof field? Uh, proof complex. Well, you just have a, a set of properties that you need your switching lemma to abide with. And that's it. And then and this so basically reduce the problem of constant depths to a switching lemma or to a circuit law. Is it correct? So I think if I understand correctly, the question is whether we actually reduce the problem of Proving bound depth regular bounds to the problem of proving bound depth circuit lower bounds. Uh, no, just uh, just is there a way? Uh, my understanding is that in constant depth regular proofs, at least the way Hasted did it, you don't need to analyze the proof. You just need to have a set of of statement of properties for the switching level, and then you say from known resolve k evaluation and so forth, I get the lower bound. Is it correct? Yes. Okay, so okay, now I think I understand the question. So the question is whether we need to analyze the structure of the proof in order to apply our switching lemma. And no, we do not. Like we just apply the switching lemma and by using it out every more time. Do you think you need a better analysis for like say circuits versus formulas? Would then some proof theory need to come into it? Or do you think a strong enough switching lemma would just be able to tell the difference, like the Rossman style? <clears throat> Robert is asking whether uh, <laughs> whether uh, such proof theory had to come in for, for this second open problem. Uh, I don't know. I really don't. I just. I mean, just about trying to apply this Rossman like this notion of time. I just don't know how to apply it. Do you think there is some kind of a supercritical regime where if you restrict one of the parameters too much, the other parameter will go out? Yeah. Or is, it, is everything smooth? Okay, so the question is whether, uh, whether there exists this uh, supercritical philosophy for that thing. And I mean, you can balance it. Like, at least in training, you can balance that. We can also do this bounded trigger, I believe. Yeah, I believe. Yes, okay. See, see, thanks, yes. Okay. I am, yeah, I'm not 100% sure. I know you can do it for trigger. Yeah, you, you, you might have to pay a little bit for the depth, like go up a little bit. Okay. But that's okay. 
So <clears throat> let's uh, thank the speaker again. And then we will convene at 2 p.m. for an afternoon of more uh, applied talks on the algorithmic side of, of uh, the complexity of that. Continuing uh, our discussion of algorithmic aspects of this.